Dismiss that uh, notification. We have several computers. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Fantastic. So, um, it's a pleasure to introduce Mark Google, who's visiting for a couple of days. Um, uh, Mark and I go way back, so we worked together when we were both at the University of Waterloo, and continue to work together over the years. It's been a great collaboration. Um, you know, Mars has done a lot of uh, nice work in, uh, you know. Quantum algorithms, but also other areas of uh, you know quantum information processing. Um, he's currently a faculty member at the University of Amsterdam. Uh, he's visiting here for a couple of days, and there are a few slots open in his schedule. So if you're interested in meeting with him while he's here, um, you know please get in touch, and we can try to find a time for you. Um, but uh, without further ado, uh, we're looking forward to hearing about quantum majority vote. Um, so yeah, it's it's nice to be here. Uh, it's been a long time since I was here last time. So I will talk about the quantum majority vote. It's a uh, joint work with all these people. And in fact, it's uh, because it's a, a special opportunity. I've actually, it's, you know, you buy one, you get one free. So I will talk actually about this sort of result as well, because these are uh, kind of closely related. So I will first talk about the first one and then afterwards, the second one is kind of like a generalization of the first. Okay, um, so yes, um, so to motivate the problem, I will start with a manifesto and it's sort of like a, well, anyway, so it's a, like a, it's, to explain the kind of the, the, the main idea. Um, and uh, get this out of the way. I have this in one thing. Yeah, so anyway, so basically, um, I don't know if I need to preach this to you, but you know, you are studying quantum and uh, computing quantum information. And so, what I'm, you know, my claim is all information is quantum. And that's it's kind of obvious because the universe is quantum. So, you know, there, it, it, everything is quantum basically, but this also means there is no classical information. So, so it's 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 a myth that there is classical information, and it's it's, it's a mathematical truth actually that there is no classical information because I, I can use this to, to show around. So, um, you know, the quantum states they form the sphere, but the classical states are just two points in the sphere. So it's a measure zero subset. So it's, it's basically does not exist, and you know. If people study algorithms, what they should really be studying is, is CPTP maps, so quantum channels, completely positive trace preserving maps. So that's a map from a sphere uh, to a sphere. And you know, because classical computer science studies only maps from bit strings to bit strings, or like from a single bit to a single bit, if it's a very simple problem, you know, it's it's a measure zero subset of all possible maps. And because of that, classical computer science is dead. Okay, so this is sort of, you know, maybe this is too extreme for you. The, the, it's just saying that yeah, everything is quantum, there is no classical thing. But, uh, you know, in practice, we, well, in everyday life, we interact with classical information. So, so this is the watered down manifesto. So let's say you are interested in purely classical problems. You have classical input and classical output. You have some bit string, basically. And, you know, for such problems, it turns out, you know, we know because of Peter Shore, if you want to, uh, build a device that solves purely classical problems, sometimes inside a device you need to do something quantum. And, uh, you know, actually what is happening inside the device, there's somewhere at the beginning, the classical information gets converted in a quantum state. And then there are many steps uh, of processing inside the device. And those steps, they have a quantum state as input and quantum state as output. And so it means that, you know, the algorithm it consists of actually quantum subroutines that are like fully quantum, they have quantum input and quantum output. And so, you know, even if you are interested in purely classical problems that has nothing to do with quantum mechanics, if you want to solve those problems very well, you should care about fully quantum subroutines, basically, because you know the best way to solve a problem in general will be using quantum algorithm. But quantum algorithm is just a sequence of sort of like these fully quantum steps to have a quantum input and quantum output. And indeed, we have already uh, many examples of such uh, such fully quantum subroutines. We have a we transform, we have a global iteration swap test, and so on. And, and quantum majority vote is, is sort of like a new primitive that also could, could be used. So that's kind of the philosophy. So basically, you know, you know, even if you if you don't subscribe to the full manifesto that everything's quantum, just from this purely practical, you know, motivation of making quantum algorithms, it's nice to have more building blocks because then we can make more quantum algorithms. Okay, so, so let's let me explain the problem. So the quantum majority vote problem. Uh, okay, so let's start with a classical majority vote. So that's very obvious. So it's just you have a, a bit string of zeros and ones, and you just want to find the majority bit. Here there are more zeros, so the majority is zero. Uh, okay, so this has many applications. So if you 
if you are, I don't know, making randomized algorithms, for example, any randomized algorithm uses majority vote at the end. You basically run the algorithm and then it, it might produce the wrong answer with some probability, but you just take majority and you can amplify the success probability from some, something bounded from away from half to arbitrarily close to one. Uh, it's also, you know, has a natural interpretation as an error correction primitive. So, you know, let's say you have a bit, you want to protect it against errors. You could uh, make several copies of this bit and then you send it through some channel and error happens. And then at the end to decode, you just take majority vote. And again, it's, it's sort of like a, you know, that, that's the, the obvious thing to do uh, for, for, for cleaning up errors. And it, it's a very natural uh, application. And, you know, also like in this picture, you can think maybe there's some kind of experiment that's supposed to produce a single bit. And every time you press the button, it's, it produces something, but it's, a, uh, you know, sometimes it was supposed to produce zero, but sometimes it produces one. And, and, and this taking majority vote just kind of gets rid of these, just these errors and gives you the, the most likely correct output. Okay, and of course it's also used in some democracies, but not in all democracies. All right, um, so, so what is quantum majority vote? It's the obvious uh, generalization to this. So basically we have, instead of uh, zeros and ones, we have quantum states. And so throughout this talk, or at least the first half of the talk, I will talk only about qubits. Mm -hmm. So basically we have a, a single qubit and we can fix some bases like psi and psi perp. And we don't know what this basis is. And we are given a bit string of these unknown states and unknown bases. And we have to figure out what is the majority state. Here there are more psi, so we should output psi. And you know, just to emphasize this once again, this is an inherently quantum problem. There is, you know, there's a quantum input and there is quantum output. And so basically, you know, my goal is, you know, as I said with the manifesto, like, you know, I want to build a useful quantum primitive and I, I'm not trying to compete with, with classical algorithms because you know, classical computer science is dead. And, you know, there's also, there's no meaningful way in, in which we are competing against classical algorithms because the problem is quantum itself. Okay, so, so why is this problem uh, non-trivial is, you know, we can't just count how many size and how many size perps we have and sort of like, we, you know, it's, it's not sort of not obvious uh, what to do. Um, and, you know, if you want to extract some kind of information about what the state is, you could measure, but you don't know in what basis to measure because the size and perp is unknown. And in fact, you know, you kind of, you don't want to measure in some sense, because if you measure, you're going to disturb the state, but you know, you want to output a quantum state. So somehow yeah, you, you could measure something, but it should not disturb the state. You, and you don't want to kind of measure it away. It should not, basically it, it kind of encodes a direction in space in some sense that you don't want to kind of lose that information. Okay, um, so, so here are some simple observations about this problem. So it's, it's not too difficult to show that there is no perfect algorithm for this problem. Okay, so again, you know, we are not competing against the classical case. There is a perfect algorithm in a classical case. You just, just count how many zeros, how many ones, and then you output the majority. You know, that all works. And you know, this is a different problem. It is more, more, more difficult, and you know, it turns out there is no perfect algorithm. And, you know, you can, it, it would contradict unitarity. Um, however, there is a trivial algorithm. Um, you can just, you know, you have this string of states, you know, size of perps. You just pick one of them at random and just output that. Right. So if there are more size, then you know, with, with, with bigger than half probability, you, you succeed. Right. So that, that's it. You know, we're we're done. I can I can go home. So there's a, we can solve the problem. Okay, but but so basically we will use this as a kind of a benchmark. So we will, you know, we since there is no classical version, we're not going to try to get the quantum speed up. It doesn't make sense. We will try to get a speed up over this trivial algorithm, basically. Right. So can we do something? Some kind of a more you know involved processing that does better <laughs> that somehow globally acts on all these states instead of just picking one of them at random. Okay, and so you know the, the success probability of the trivial uh, algorithm is is just the number of the majority states, so the number of sites in this case, divided by a number of qubits. So then that's kind of the, the baseline that we're um, uh, comparing against. And by the way, if there are any questions, any points, you know, just feel free to interrupt. All right, so that's that's the problem. Uh, so let me right away give away the uh, the main results, the uh, you know how well we can do. Okay, so we are so you know as I said, we cannot solve this problem perfectly quantumly. So we're interested in what is the uh, optimal output fidelity. So you know how close can we produce a state to the to the optimal state? 
And we consider two cases. There is a no promise case where basically the number of psi and psi perps are not in any way limited. So in particular, you could be, so like this, if you are very close to the middle, it means you have roughly high, half of the states to be um, psi and uh, roughly half to be psi perp. And that's obviously gonna be a difficult case to, to find out the majority state. And the promise case is when you promise uh, the number of psi is like, if you're kind of away from the main, so like these are, you have a very linear size or very few size. In this case, basically there is, uh, there is, you know, um, Anyway, so this, this promise case will be easier because there will be sort of a, a bigger difference between the majority and minority. And, you know, we are interested in a worst case. So basically in a, in a no promise case, the worst case is when you're really right next to the half. So let's say n is given, n is odd, because if n is given, that means it's not clear what the majority is. So let's say n is odd, then basically these two points are the worst case. And then here, when you are kind of on the edge, it's case. Um, okay, so the trivial algorithm is basically, uh, you know, if you just pick one state at random and out of it, uh, the the output state LB will be very close to half, and you will just deviate by line to, to, to n, so that's um, just like the size of this gap, basically. And in the other case, you are promised that, like, a constant fraction, like 5 over 6 of the states are the majority states, and in that case, you know, that's that's your uh, that's in the worst case, you will uh, have a, a fit out P506 in a trivial algorithm. Okay, so what we show is that the optimal algorithm for this problem has fidelity that goes like this. So it basically, I mean, you know, it, it's not, you know, it, it's still going to be close to half, and that's that's kind of clear because if you have half of the states roughly inside half, it's going to be inside terms, it's going to be a difficult problem. But you know, here the basically we are doing a little bit better as well. A little bit more away from the half, and in a promise case, actually, uh, what you can see is that if n is gets big, then actually this probability, uh, this, this fidelity goes goes to one. So somehow, uh, if it, you know, basically, in, in a promise case, if you have more lots of states, then then you can actually solve the problem pretty pretty well. All right, so this is the, sort of like a summary of the main results. I don't know, is there any question? About this? Excuse me. Yep. Uh, this is Nicole Younger Halpern via Zoom. Uh, yeah. Do you also have any constructions for how you would achieve the optimal results? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I just sort of gave away the result, but I will explain um, what the algorithm is that, that that achieves this fidelity. And I will explain also a little bit about the analysis, like how do you prove optimality? Because he, we have a, a tight characterization here. Thanks. Okay, any, any other questions? All right. Okay. So, 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 yeah. That's the result. Uh, but now let's uh, let's see uh, how do we uh, show this. Right. So this this involves representation theory. So now I will have like sort of an interlude and representation theory. I don't know if I mean I just think maybe you maybe you already know. If not, then you can learn something new. Okay. So so right. So basically, so let's let's just consider the the following uh, problem. So let's say we have some arbitrary matrix A B C D. And this matrix, like it could be unitary, but it doesn't matter. It could even be symbolic. This is not by the matrix, and you have two copies of this matrix. And you know, let's say you act on the zero zero state yeah. on the first base state. So then you're just gonna get the first column of this matrix. So it's gonna look like this. And you know, but, but the interesting thing is if you you can expand this this, this first column as a vector um, as a linear combination like this, like if you just write it in a bracket notation. And you know, basically, it's a linear combination of these. I mean, they should be pointing here that the online people can see. So it's a linear combination of the Hamming weight zero state and Hamming weight one state, like a superposition of all Hamming weight one states and Hamming weight two states. Um, okay, so that's one observation. And the other observation is that um, I mean, basically, this this state lives in a symmetric subspace. So it's, it's just a com linear combination of these states that are themselves symmetrical. Okay, so the and the other observation, if, if you take the singlet state, which is anti-symmetric, so if you exchange the two qubits, you get a minus sign. Then if you act with two copies of this uh, of this two by two matrix, you will just get the state back. So it's basically it's an eigenvector. And you know, for any two by two matrix, if you tensor it twice, this singlet state is an eigenvector and has eigenvalue that's the determinant of this matrix. That's a simple calculation you can do. Okay, so that that's these are two interesting observations. But now we can put these observations together 
and we can make what's called a Schur transform uh, on two qubits. So this is a four by four matrix where we basically we take this singlet state, so this anti-symmetric state as a, as the first um, as the first row of the matrix, and then the last three rows are just these. Um, so this is the, the zero zero state, and this is the Hamming weight one state, the uniform superposition of Hamming weight one, and this is the Hamming weight uh, two state, the one one state. Right. So now if you make this kind of matrix that just encodes a singlet state and then an orthonormal basis for the symmetric subspace. And if you do a basis change on any two by two matrix, uh, two copies of that matrix, what you will get is a block matrix that looks like this. You have the determinant here, and then you have some kind of a, a bit more funky three by three block here. Um, yeah, so basically the, this first block comes from this singlet from the anti-symmetric subspace and this three by three block comes from the symmetric subspace. And so not only that, but also if you take a permutation, and there's the only permutation for two systems is just to exchange them then uh, this permutation diagonalizes. So basically for the anti-symmetric subspace, you have eigenvalue minus one, and for the symmetric subspace, you have eigenvalue plus one. So that's how the swap operator, I mean, it's by definition, like the symmetric subspace is where it, uh, it just acts symmetrically and anti-symmetric subspace has minus one. Okay, but so, so what is interesting about these two blocks is that they are homomorphisms for matrix multiplication. So basically, you know, so this determinant, you know, we know all that determinant is a homomorphism. If you take a product of two matrices and you compute determinant, so I'm just calling this block, so any of these blocks, I'm calling it Q, you know, determinant has this, this property, but also interestingly, this three by three block, it also has this property. So this is not obvious at all, but like this three by three block, if you just plug in two arbitrary matrices, uh, you, you can always check that this holds, okay? All right, so basically this is the simplest example of what's, what's called Schur transform. And you know, what Schur transform does, it basically block diagonalizes like tensor powers of an arbitrary matrix. And it also block diagonalizes uh, permutations. All right, so now to kind of explain it in a bit more uh, detail, I want to show you the most beautiful equation in mathematics. So maybe somebody knows the most beautiful equation. Right, so I assume that people are thinking of this equation, but this is not the most beautiful equation. This is the second most beautiful equation. <laughs> so the most beautiful equation is this one. And maybe the people at the back cannot see it. Okay, so, so what is this equation? So in this equation, it basically maps uh, a two by two matrix, you know, completely arbitrary two by two matrix with, you can put some symbolic variables. And it outputs a big matrix that's like L plus one. So there's like, a, I don't know if you can see there's, a, so it's size uh, L plus one basically. Uh, so this it's like just, these are basically the JK entries. And so this big formula is the JK entry of this, uh, of this matrix. And you know, and this formula, it looks, you know, maybe not very beautiful, but it's, it's very simple. You can just write it down in Mathematica and you press enter and it spits out the matrix. And there are just some coefficients with some square roots and factorials. And then here there's a monomial that has different powers of A, B, C, D. So the A, B, C, D are the entries of the two by two matrix. So you know, it is, it's just like basically every entry of the output matrix is just you know, basically some polynomial of this A, B, C, D. Okay, so why is this the most beautiful equation in mathematics? Is that this map that it's just an explicit formula for a map which which is is a homomorphism uh, under matrix multiplication or this is called a representation basically. Um, so you know it just maps two by two matrices to matrices of size like L plus one times L plus one, and you know and you can basically take this two by two matrix and you can blow it up to any size you want, and and the resulting matrix will always be compatible with matrix multiplication in, in, in this sense, and you know it doesn't matter if this matrix could be. It doesn't have to be unitary, it can be with arbitrary symbolic entries. And you know, not only that, it, this is an irreducible representation. So it's not a direct sum of representations. Uh, like one, one way you could do this is just to like take two copies, like a direct sum of your original matrix with itself. And that's like a boring way to make a bigger matrix that's compatible with matrix multiplication, but this is, is irreducible. You kind of break it into, into blocks. And in fact, you can show that any irreducible representation of two by two matrix is, is basically equivalent uh, to this up to some basis change. All right, uh, so, and in physics, this is called the Wigner D matrix. There, uh, there's a Wikipedia article about this if you want to look it up. Okay, so now, you know, this is, here's an example of the output of this formula. You know, okay, the formula was maybe scary, but this output is very nice. So if you have a one by one matrix, then it just outputs the number one. And that's, that's you know, if you multiply one with itself, it's gonna be a homomorphism. For two by two matrices, you just get the matrix back. back. For three by three, you get this the one that I showed you before. And then, you know, you get these bigger and bigger matrices and they have some kind of nice pattern and some kind of combinatorial structure. And, you know, I think this is a very good. 
Okay, so now, um, so so there is another way to look at this. Uh, it's it's closely related to the symmetric subspace. So let's uh, let's let's do uh, the following. So let's just take. Uh, so we have uh, l uh, l qubits. Let's just take uniform superposition over all standard basis vectors that have some uh, Hamming weight w. We just fix you know l the number of qubits. We fix w. And then we take uniform superposition of all these uh, uh, Hamming way W uh, states, and then we normalize. And so these are called symmetric or, or DT states of, of Hamming way W. And you know another way to describe this matrix I showed you before is basically the entries of that matrix that I showed you. Uh, they are just equal to taking L copies of your two by two matrix and then expressing it into the symmetric subspace. So this metric subspace has dimension L plus one because Hamming weight goes from zero to L. And so, you know, you can show that this, this basically, this is another way to, to, to get this, this kind of the most beautiful formula in mathematics. Okay, so basically, you know, this, all, all this, this QL, this, this representation is doing is just expressing L uh, copies of the matrix in symmetric subspace. And like this, M tensor L is of course symmetric under permutations. And so, so it's kind of natural that it, it should have, uh, you know, some kind of uh, nice action in symmetric subspace. Okay. Um, and, you know, using this, you can make actually a quite explicit uh, sure basis for qubits. So, you know, like, I mean, it, it's, it's, it, it's, it's sort of not so obvious how to make this uh, sure transform in general. Also, I gave you an example on two qubits. Uh, but you like for qubits, there's actually a, a pretty explicit construction and it works as follows. So first uh, you take, um, so we will have these different blocks uh, and these blocks are parameterized by Lambda. So Lambda is a partition of N, meaning that it's just, it's just the two numbers that sum to N and they are non-negative. It's like you take a chocolate bar with N squares and you, you know, cut it in the middle, not in the middle, but in two pieces. And one is of length Lambda one and the other one is Lambda two. Okay, so then we're gonna define these states that have three components. So this is, it's like a, a state on N qubits and we have these parameters. So the first parameter will be Lambda and the second will be Hamming weight and the third one we just keep zero for now. And what this is, is just, we take one of these, uh, these symmetric states that I showed you before. So has Hamming weight W and then, you know, this number of qubits. And then on the remaining qubits, we just put a bunch of singlet states. So this, this psi minus is just the unsymmetric uh, two qubit uh, state. And you know what you can show, and this is actually, it immediately follows from what I said before, if you take N copies now, so, so now N is gonna be bigger than we, before we had just L that was kind of smaller, but if you have N copies of, of your matrix and you express it uh, sort of in this basis of these states, you end up because you have this symmetric state, you will just get uh, you know a matrix of this of this Q, like matrix element of this Q, and because you have these singlets, you have lambda two singlets. So for every singlet is an uh, you know it's an uh, if you act with the same matrix in both qubits of a singlet, you get a determinant as an eigenvalue. So you'll just get some power of determinant basically, which is equal to how many singlets you have. Okay, and so. And so this basically gives you, okay, so this is not complete description of the, of the sure basis for uh, n qubits, but you, okay, you need to have this other index here and you kind of, you can extend it in a certain way, but I'm not gonna uh, talk about that. And so basically, so these states that you obtain, uh, that will be, you know, it will contain these states and then uh, some extra states that I did not explain, uh, they, it, it ends up forming an orthonormal basis for, for n qubits. And, you know, anyways, and so ba basically there's a certain number of, you know, Certain range for W and certain range for I. That's you know here are explicit formulas, but it doesn't matter. All right. Uh, is there any questions about this? Yeah. I just did an case question. So what what is S sub lambda one minus lambda two W? That's like a DP state on. Yes. How yeah. Many it's on whatever is this subscript. Uh, that's how many qubits, uh, like lambda one minus lambda two, and then uh, the W is the Hamming weight. Okay. Um, yeah. Wait, sorry. Yep. Do you know that? Mm -hmm. um, is this an n qubit state? Yeah. So yeah, because so this state is on lambda one minus lambda two qubits, and this is a singlet state that's on two qubits. It's the anti-symmetric two qubit state. So there are two lambda two qubits here, and then there is lambda one minus lambda two qubits here. Oh, that's, that's a two qubit. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So then in total there is like you know lambda one plus lambda two, and that's n. That's the total number. Okay, all right. So, you know, and then basically 
okay, so, so here's how the Schur transform is, is, is defined more generally. So it basically takes these n qubits and it's gonna, so it's gonna take this uh, space and decompose it as a direct sum of these, um, you know, several blocks. And within each block, you will have uh, the sort of like two registers, like a tensor product structure. And these two registers correspond to these, these two, like this W and I here. And so this W sort of like it, it corresponds to, to, the, to the entries of these two by two matrices. And this I has to do something with permutations. And, and the Schur transform is basically this, this operation. So given these states that I defined almost completely before, I defined them for I equals zero, but anyways, um, they, it just maps these states into a direct sum of, of these tensor product states. Okay, and so, so it has nice properties. So in particular, if you have n copies of any two by two matrix, if you apply the Schur transform, uh, so, okay, it's a unitary transform also. Uh, so anyway, it will give you, you know, it will give you a block matrix and it has these two registers. And in the first register, you have one of these, these most beautiful matrices that I showed you before, an identity in the other register. And similarly, if you take any permutation uh, pi, so the permutation just permutes the n qubits uh, in some arbitrary way, then it will have the opposite structure. You have the identity in the first register and, and, and some representation of that permutation in the second register. And you can see that these two matrices commute. And that's basically because, you know, if you apply the same operation on all qubits and then permute the qubits, that's the same as applying, that's the same as first permuting the qubits and applying the same operation on all of them. So basically it's kind of obvious that permutations and M tensor N commute. And in a sure basis, that's kind of reflected by the fact that you have identity here and something here. And here it's the other way around basically. Okay, and so, you know, from so that's kind of mathematically, but from the quantum computing perspective is that you can actually implement this. And, you know, there's first was, was uh, like Aram Harrow's thesis and the work by uh, Dave Bacon and, and uh, John and, and Harrow, where they show that this can be done in polynomial time, but there is like an explicit paper uh, by Kirby and Strouch that, that shows that you can do it in like number of qubits n to the fourth basically gates. And they give explicit like a, they even write a program that generates a circuit. Okay, uh, so that, that's, that's the Schur transform on n qubits. And so now, you know, um, Nicole was asking, what is the, what is the construction? So, so here is how the algorithm goes. So we'll use the Schur transform. And, you know, again, let me just remind you that, you know, if you have n copies of any matrix, it will block diagonalize into matrix like this. So you'll have some kind of block that depends on your input here, and this will be just identity. Okay, so, but in a quantum majority vote, we don't have n copies of the same state. We have like, you know, some number of copies of the state, and then we have some number of copies of the orthogonal state. But, you know, let's just ignore that. Let's say we have, you know, lots of states that are the same, and then a couple of states that are, are, are different, but, you know, let, it's going to be kind of similar to this. So let's just kind of pretend that it is actually what looks like this. Okay. okay, so then what would we do? Well, okay, yeah. Well, other than just outputting one qubit at random. Uh, so if we want to make the, all these qubits interact somehow, we want to entangle them together. So we can apply the Schur transform, and then we, you know, we get this, this block matrix as output. And then we can measure this lambda. So this is a block diagonal matrix. We can just ask in which block are we? And this is, you know, it, it doesn't disturb the state. So we kind of get this for free, basically. So this is called weak Schur sampling. And okay, so once we measure lambda, we kind of end up collapsing on one of these blocks, basically. We just have this Q tensor identity. And, you know, this identity is just a maximally mixed state uh, up to some normalization. So we don't really care about this. It has no information about rho. We can just throw this away, basically. So we are just left with this, this representation of our state. And so basically at this point, what we have is, is a representation of our state, which the representation itself is, of, is on, of, of random dimension, because, you know, this lambda that we sampled, but was, it, it has some distribution, it's at random. Okay, so now we have this representation of the state of a random dimension, and we basically want to uh, just, we, you know, the goal is to produce a qubit as an output that has the majority state, so we need to map this, this state of a random dimension to just a single qubit. And, and what we end up doing is as follows, because this, this Q lambda rho, you know, one way to define it was this, this, this crazy formula. And the other way was just saying that's the action of, you know, certain number of, um, of uh, co copies of rho in a symmetric subspace. So you can basically apply some isometry to embed this in a symmetric subspace, and it will be on this number of qubits. 
And, and then we just, uh, you know, if we would do that, then we would get something that looks like sort of raw, several copies of raw, like this number of copies of raw. And then we discard all qubits except one, and then we should get raw back. So basically, like, you know, if we have n copies of raw, then this procedure that I described, it should give us raw back. So that's good because if all the states were the same, the majority should be the, you know, the, the row itself. But then you can show that, you know, if, if there are some of the rows are different, that they are perpendicular to the original row, then this procedure still gives you the majority state with, with good fidelity. Okay, so I'm kind of the intuit. Well, I mean, I basically, you know, it's from what I ex explained before, it's not too hard to see that for row tensor n, this procedure is just going to give you a row. But, but in general, if you have, you know, uh, arbitrary state has some row perps as well, then this works still pretty well. All right, so that's that's that was the uh, algorithm. Are there any questions about the algorithm? Okay. All right. Uh, so now, so what I'm going to do now, I'm going to generalize this problem because, like, basically, this kind of approach can be used to solve more problems, and uh, you know, not only majority, but we can look at other um, uh, problems, and then afterwards, I will generalize generalize once once again. Okay, so the so the first generalization is basically the following, you know. So the original quantum majority vault problem was this: we want to find a majority state, and somehow I think it's useful to think about it also as a as a computation in an unknown basis. Like so, here we are trying to compute the majority function in in an unknown basis. That's the science I perp. But you can imagine computing some arbitrary function. So basically, we have this scenario. We have like a some kind of a weak computer that has some data and it encodes like, let's say a bit string, it encodes it in zeros and ones. And, and this is a bit of a kind of a crypto setting. So maybe, I don't know, maybe this has some cryptographic applications, but I just wanted to point out. So you can imagine it sends this data to the, to the other big computer on the earth, but you know, either on purpose, it's maybe trying to hide the input by applying some, uh, some random unitary U on every qubit, or maybe it's just, you know, the atmosphere has some turbulence and you send a photon polarized in one way and when it arrives, it's polarized in a different way. So maybe they don't have the same reference frame. So basically it arrives in some, some basis size I perp. Um, and, you know, if this computer is able to compute the function, so in this case, let's say majority function, then when you send it back, then it, you know, it traverses the atmosphere the opposite direction and gets, you know, the U gets undone. Or maybe this, this party, you know, uh, was hiding the data on purpose, then they can just undo the U because they chose the U. Okay. So you can imagine computing in this kind of fashion, not just the majority function, but other functions as well. And you can think of it as like you're delegating the computation, you're trying to hide the data, or you could think that you just maybe because of the, the misalignment of the reference frames, maybe you just don't have the same basis, but you still wanna somehow uh, delegate the computation to somebody else. Okay, so then, so, so I will call this equivariant computation. So basically we are given some arbitrary Boolean function from n bits to one bit. And you know, the sort of the, the obvious way to, to say what it means to compute this function would be uh, to say that you have a standard basis state on n qubits, it has the input string and you produce one qubit has the output. You know, you want to, this happen for every X, but if you don't know the basis, if then if you want to compute this in any possible basis like psi, psi perp, then you want to implement this transformation for all X and for all U basically. And so this, this in mathematics, this is called equivariance when you basically change the, you vary the input and the output varies sort of in the same way equally. And so this is, this is a continuous symmetry of the problem. And, and this is like a, it's a continuous version of a discrete symmetry. So the discrete symmetry would be just, it, it's called, well, I will call it equivariance, but it's also called self-duality. So it's basically, you know, a Boolean function is self-dual if you negate the, every bit of the input, it's the same as negating the, the output. But for example, the majority function, you have like a string of zeros and ones, you know, if you replace the zeros by ones, then also in the output, you should replace the zeros by ones. So the, the, the function is self-dual, but there are other functions that have this, this property. And so basically, you know, we, we kind of, we wanna take a function that, that has this discrete symmetry, this self-duality or this equivari equivariance, uh, we want to extend it to, to a, a function uh, that is that has a continuous symmetry, basically. And just a sort of small remark, like these, you know, basically this, this equivariance is, is sort of, a, anyway, it, it, is, it puts some restriction on your function. So for example, 
if you have a function that is equivariant, but also symmetric, so when I say symmetric, I mean symmetric under permuting the, the input bits. So then, then it, it, it from that, so basically that requires n to be odd. So here's just a small explanation. So for example, you know, you want to compute your function on a string that has like a Hamming weight exactly half, then you can write this 0, 0, 1, 1 by negation of 1, 1, 0, 0. And if your function is equivariant, then you can, instead of negating the input, you can negate the output. And if your function is also symmetric, you can permute this, this bit string back into 0, 0, 1, 1, just exchange the order of the zeros and ones. And you get a contradiction. You get like, you know, f of something has to be the negation of f of that same input. So basically, you know, if you have even number of inputs, then this equivariance is not compatible with symmetry. But if you have odd number of inputs, then, then there's no problem. All right, so, so what is the setup? So the setup is basically we have an arbitrary function, a Boolean function from n bits to one bit. This function is equivariant or like a self-dual, so negating input negates the output. It is symmetric under permuting the input bits and this forces n to be odd. Um, and the task is that we are given, you know, input string x in an unknown basis. Every qubit is scrambled up with the same unitary. And we want to produce some state that's close to the uh, the value of the function in the same basis. And this should work for every input and for every uh, every basis. And okay, so we're not gonna be able to solve this exactly for the majority, we can solve this exactly. So we need to have a, a measure of success. And so this this uh, meaningful measure is, is the worst case fidelity. So it's basically, we, we are gonna be optimizing over all quantum channels. That's, you know, quantum algorithm is a quantum channel. And we minimizing, we look at the worst case over all inputs and all bases. And we just take your, our input in, you know, in this unknown basis, we apply the channel and then we compare with the right output, basically. So the channel spits out a density matrix and it takes in a density matrix in general. So that's, is there any question about so this, this more general problem? I have a question again. Yeah. Uh, this is Nicole again. Um, since you described in the possible motivation for this generalization, how mm -hmm the person performing the computation doesn't know the relevant computational basis, so it doesn't know something about the data. This sounds reminiscent of homomorphic encryption. But do you know if uh, these results that you've presented have any relationship with algorithms in homomorphic encryption? Yeah, I don't know. So, I mean, um, uh, I just wanted to kind of emphasize this cryptographic flavor in case somebody who is working on this kind of stuff, you know, wants to have a look at it, but I haven't thought about it myself. So I, I mean, I, I don't know if this is a useful primitive for some kind of homomorphic uh, computation or not. Um, because, I mean, sort of, there is also this question of, you know, when you compute majority vote, what is the side information that this computer learns? Like, for example, I mean, in this case, it turns out that it, there, there's some, like, because you perform some kind of measurement, so you extract some information, you do this weak short sampling, and, you know, that gives you basically the ratio of the number of size inside perps. And so there is some information that actually leaks to this, uh, to this party. Um, but I, I don't know what is sort of the, the trade, like, so, so, yeah, anyway, so even the optimal protocol is going to leak some information about the data. So that's, you know, that's one problem. And another problem is I don't know what is the trade-off between you know when this when, when this guy is trying to cheat. Like I'm basically in this talk, I'm kind of looking at it algorithmically. I'm just assuming this guy is trying to do the best um, and sort of not like in particular they're not trying to like measure the state and do some tomography or something because we want to achieve the best fidelity. We don't want to kind of ruin the state. But yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah. So anyway, the short answer is I I don't know if this is useful for homomorphic encryption, but it has. A little bit like flavor like that and i think it's an interesting question to investigate okay thanks your response actually um but another question and yep. people have been approaching quantum voting from multiple perspectives and one of the perspective that perspective that got on a lot of attention is uh security of voting do, do, do you, you see any ways to um make your majority voting protocol secure or maybe that's an opportunity for future work that you'll talk about at the end. What is the meaning of this uh, security voting? Um, well, um, actually, maybe this would be more relevant to say how votes are. Well, it just I guess the general uh, problem is that when votes are transmitted and processed, we need to ensure that no cheating happens. Yes. Yeah, I, I guess you could like, 
Right. I mean, so like, you know, we look at the problem of outputting the majority state and sort of, uh, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. Like, I, I don't know how you could check that there was no cheating. Uh, yeah. Anyway, okay. like, like, you know, I, I'm basically, yeah, I, I think these are interesting questions and, and, and I encourage people to think about them. Okay. Uh, all right. So yeah. So this was the this was the setup for an arbitrary function. And so now the question is, you know, what is the algorithm? And basically, the algorithm is essentially the same. So this was the previous algorithm. So we, you know, we do all these steps. And basically, we're just gonna modify these last two steps. So instead of so when we when we do these steps, we end up with this q lambda of rho, and then we embed it in symmetric subspace and discard all qubits. But so we instead of doing that, we will basically we need to apply some map from whatever is the dimension of this state to a one qubit and you know uh, th that that map is has to be unitary equivariant so it has to kind of uh, commute with unitaries and it has one qubit output because that's the output of the function as as, as one bit basically and you know now the question is what which unitary equivariant channel should we apply at this point basically and so here is here is the here's the deal so Basically, what you can show is that if you look at these kind of unitary equivariant channels from some dimension, so, so here basically what I mean by unitary equivariant is that there is a representation of unitary group acting on, on the input space. And you know the two by two matrix itself is acting on the output. And what you can show is that there are only uh, two uh, such channels basically, and the general channel is a convex combination of these two. And so basically, anyway, so people who know representation theory, these two channels correspond to like removing a box from this diagram, either from the first row or from the second row. And if you remove from the first row, then this, this corresponds to, in some sense, to partial trace. So this was in the original algorithm. Basically, what I was saying is that you embed the state in symmetric subspace and you throw away all the qubits except, except one. So that, that's this partial trace. And the other extreme uh, covariant or unitary covariant channel is this it's called universal knot operation. So this is basically the problem of you are given um, like one copy of psi or maybe several copies of psi and you wanna produce the unique orthogonal state. So you are in, in two dimensions. So there's a unique orthogonal state psi perp. And you just wanna have a map that maps uh, a state to, the, to its orthogonal state. And this has been studied uh, quite, uh, you know, quite extensively and, and there's no, you know, there's no uh, exact, uh, uh, there is no physical operation to do this, but uh, you can approximate it to a certain extent. And, and this best approximation is this universal knot, basically. And so it means that this channel that we need to apply in the final step of the algorithm is just specified by one number. So for every lambda, we have one number, and that's just the probability in the convex combination between these two channels. And so, you know, if you want to find the best algorithm, then for every lambda, we need for every uh, partition or every block in the matrix, we need to find the best parameter. And so anyway, and these channels uh, also we show that you can implement them in a the simple way. Okay, so, uh, right. So, okay, so let me just then summarize the, the main result. So basically we have the setup when we have a symmetric and equivariant function and we have odd n, we wanna compute it in an unknown basis. And we also wanna know what's the best fidelity with which we can compute. And so what we show in a paper is that, uh, so basically that this algorithm is specified, like I explained by, by these uh, parameters, uh, these T lambda. So that's for every lambda, it's just uh, you know, one real number between zero and one. And we, we show that you can just write down a very small linear program of size that's like N, which is the number of qubits uh, that gives you the optimal choice of these parameters. And it also gives you the optimal uh, fidelity. So this, this F. And in fact, I, I think one, one, one can also obtain an explicit solution of this linear program. So I haven't had time to work it out, but basically we give a linear program, but I think one can obtain a closed formula actually. And, you know, and, and basically what I showed you before, this algorithm uh, that it, it, it implements, you can implement this, this optimal, uh, optimal uh, unitary equivalent channel and, and it has complexity that scales like n to the force. And so this complexity comes from the Schur transform. Basically, the, the most complicated step in the algorithm is Schur transform, and the rest is, is relatively straightforward. Okay, so uh, so that's that was the sort of the, the, this first paper and the majority vote. And uh, anyway, so you know we can compute. So there's a table here all the fidelities of all the all the seven bit functions. Uh, actually, maybe I can say for so for people who are interested in query complexity, I think what is interesting is that sort of there are some parallels with quantum query complexity. So basically. So we look at you know the query complexity of 
of symmetric functions has been pretty well understood. And it depends only on certain parameters. So if you make the truth table of your function, so this, this function is symmetric. So the truth table just depends only on a Hamming weight, basically, of the inputs. And so, and there is a certain parameter, which is like, you know, if you start from the middle of this truth table and you go to one side and see how many times you have a constant like zero, that's sort of the width of this interval basically specifies fully the query complexity. And somehow the same thing happens also with the optimal fidelity in our setting. Is it turns out it's just uh, determined by this. So basically, this tree that I drew drew here, it's you kind of if you start reading this truth table from the middle, you see like zero zero one. So you go like zero zero one. So basically, for this function, the query complexity, it, sorry, the optimal fidelity is, is this number. And sort of what happens further down in truth table doesn't matter. So somehow there's something we observe numerically, and I think, but, but we haven't uh, proved this rigorously. But so, so it seems like there is some kind of uh, similarity with with quantum query complexity, and I think that's an interesting uh, question to explore. All right. So, uh, are there any questions about this? And then I have one more generalization. Okay. All right. So, okay. So, you know, you can ask even more general question. Um, you know. So I'm. You know, as I said, I'm interested in, in, in quantum algorithms with quantum input and quantum output. So you can say, well, you know, what is a quantum algorithm? It's a quantum channel. It has like, you know, n qubits as input and n m qubits as output in a most general case. So, you know, you want to find the best algorithm. So you want to optimize of these channels. And, you know, that's a completely positive trace preserving map. And let's assume that we are in this setting when we have these symmetries, so it's unitary equivariant. So meaning if you uh, change the base on all inputs, then the same basis change happens on all the outputs. And okay, so I'm not gonna be very uh, explicit about, oops, about this, but uh, we also will assume some extra symmetry. So for example, that it's symmetric under permuting the inputs and outputs. But so anyway, I'm sweeping stuff under the rug, but we also assume some kind of discrete symmetry. And the question is, you know, how can we optimize over such channels? If we want to find the best channel for a certain operation, you know, uh, you know, how do how do we do this? And okay, so, so first we need to describe the channel in some uh, some nice way, and the most convenient way is using the so-called Choi matrix. So the Choi matrix is this very simple construct where you basically you take your channel and you apply it onto all standard base matrices. So these are matrices that have all zeros and then one in a certain position. And then you just make a big block matrix where you kind of in every block labeled by i and j, you just put the output of the channel basically. And of course, you know, this matrix has the full information about the channel because if you have linear combination of these matrices, then you can just take linear combination of these blocks and you can recover the output of the channel. And so anyway, there's a formula for uh, explicit simple formula, how to recover the output using this join matrix. But sort of the, the point is that it's it's very easy to disc, to parameterize or sort of to characterize uh, quantum channels. Basically, what you want is a matrix that's completely positive, and it has certain partial trace equal to identity. So this this sorry the, the matrix is positive semi-definite, which corresponds with channel being completely positive, and then there's uh, this partial trace constraint that that means that uh, the channel is trace preserved. So basically, this is a semi-definite constraint, and this is a linear constraint. And so it means that naturally, if you want to optimize over quantum channels, you end up having a semi-definite program. And you know, and now the question is, how can we throw in this uh, this unitary equivariance into the semi-definite program? So if we optimize over channels and have this uh, continuous symmetry, we want to add this extra constraint. So you know, uh, okay. So what does it mean? Uh, so we we have this basically this kind of symmetry. If you if you do a basis change on input on every input system, then the same base change has to happen on the uh, every output system. And you know what what is turns out uh, if you know it's a simple thing to show is that this expressed in terms of the Choi matrix will be that it has to commute with all matrices of this form. So you have like n copies of U and m copies of the complex conjugate of U, and then you tensor everything together, and whatever U you choose, your Choi matrix has to commute with this. And so this imposes uh, well, this imposes infinitely continuously many constraints on your matrix. But since it imposes so many constraints, it means there should be lots of parameters that get some sort of symmetrized or uh, you, that you that you get rid of basically. Okay, so now okay, how much time I have? Yeah, I don't have much time. So yeah, so basically, if we want to understand these matrices, we understand we need to mathematically understand what is the commutant of this. So what what are the, all the matrices that commute with with all the you know all these unitaries basically? And the answer is, is, is this is described by what's called Wald-Brauer algebra. 
So this has a scary name, but all it is, it's, it's kind of like a generalization of the symmetric group. So, so let's say you have like a, a permutation on n plus m uh, uh, objects. And you know you could draw it as a as a diagram uh, where you just connect these 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 top objects with the bottom objects, and then here on the right side you flip this this permutation upside down. Then you're going to obtain a, a diagram that's not a permutation anymore, because it will have some kind of uh, some strands that go horizontally. They connect the bottom to bottom and top to top, but but these horizontal strands they always go across this middle, and this is called wall. It sort of separates the two sides. So this is all, all it is, it's, I call it partially transposed permutation. You just you know, transpose this side and then you get the permutation. So because of that, the number of these diagrams is just the number of permutations, which is n plus m factorial. And you, know, you can multiply these diagrams in the same way as permutations. You just put them together and, and then you, you, know, you just obtain another diagram. But sometimes you might end up with these loops and then you just put a constant. So that the, the dimension basically that you have of every system to the power of number of loops basically is going to be the constant. And this is basically, this is the trace of the identity matrix. So this diagram is kind of like a trace of identity matrix. So this, this forms an algebra. You can take linear combinations, you can multiply these things, and you can also represent these diag diagrams by matrices. So, so basically, like for example, if you have this, this diagram that's like a swap operation, this is just a swap matrix. It's like a two by two uh, swap gate. Uh, and if you have this, uh, I call it contraction, uh, that's, it goes across the wall. So it's like these horizontal lines. This is basically the maximally entangled state. So you would represent it on two qubits by, by unnormalized maximally entangled state. And you know, for a general mate, for, for a general diagram, you can write sort of a similar formula that captures this. Okay, and so, so the, the basically the, 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 the main point is that, so there is an extension of the sure duality uh, to these, this is called mixed tensors because they have these U and U bar. And it basically says that the commutant of this is equal to the matrices. The psi is the map that maps the diagrams to matrices. It's just all the matrices that you obtain from these diagrams, basically. And this is similar to like for the normal sure wild duality when we don't have this extra U bar, then the commutant of, of U tensor N is just the permutation matrices that permute the systems. Okay, and okay, so then it means that, you know, if we have a unitary equivariant channel, it's the same as the Choi matrix commutes with all these matrices. It's the same as the Choi matrix is in, in is a linear combination of these of these diagrams, basically. And there is also a notion of a Schur transform, which, which block diagonalizes such matrix. And here it's it's sort of more complicated. I don't want to go into details, but, but there are also these two registers and one is for the unitary group. And there you have identity because it commutes with the unitaries. And in the other block, you have some, some kind of a complicated matrix. Okay, and so basically the, the point of sort of the strategy of optimizing over these channels with the continuous symmetries is that we, you know, instead of having a semi-definite constraint for this matrix, we can just put a positive semi-definite constraint for every block of this matrix. And moreover, if we have additional symmetries, which I will not go into, like some permutational symmetries, then this block actually becomes diagonal. It gets symmetrized due to Schur's lemma, and it just becomes a constant times identity matrix, basically. And, and if it becomes a constant times identity matrix, then you don't have a semi-different program anymore. You just have a linear program. And so basically in some cases, when you have so much symmetry, you can actually say that your matrix is diagonal in a very specific basis. And, 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 and then your semi-different program just becomes a linear program. So, so the, the, the punchline is that basically what we show is that if you have an arbitrary uh, semi-different program with you know, linear constraints and inequalities and semi-different constraints, and you throw in also this, this unitary equivariance, then uh, you know, at first this is a really scary uh, semi-different program because it has infinitely many constraints, like continuously infinitely many. The matrix is of huge size, like you know, D to the N plus M. So there's no way you can solve this naively. Like for example, if you have like four inputs and one output of your channel and every output has dimension 100, then it has 10 to the 30 variables. So it's like just in, in, impossible to solve this on a computer. But you know, using this kind of um, representation theory, what you can show is actually this X is block diagonal and you know, even maybe uh, even diagonal in some cases. And for example, you know, in, in, you, it will not be a matrix of, with this number of entries, it will just be a linear combination of these diagrams. And the number of diagrams is n plus n factorial, and in this case is 120. 
So basically, instead of having this huge matrix with 10 to 30 variables, you can just write your matrix as a linear combination of diagrams, and there's only 120 variables. So there's like a huge reduction in the number of variables. And so anyway, so we, we show, uh, we show uh, a general way of taking these uh, some different programs and reducing to much smaller linear programs. And you know, that, that's, yeah, anyway, so that, that can be used to solve all kinds of problems. Like this majority vote, for example, is an instance of, of, of this, where we, uh, you know, we had a function that has all these kind of symmetries and you can use this approach uh, to solve these kinds of problems. Okay, because I'm out of time. So let me uh, just quickly say the open uh, problems. So I think one really obvious open problem is that, so for the quantum majority vote, so I was assuming the input was just a tensor product of size and psi perps. And the kind of the intuition was that we have a device that's supposed to be outputting psi, and sometimes it fails and it outputs psi perp instead. But that's a very peculiar failure mode. So like, you know, if you do experiments, you know, if your experiment fails, why should it produce exactly the right answer, but you know, exactly orthogonal to the answer? And I think a nice, interesting question is when you have, uh, the basically the input of the majority vote to be states that are not restricted to any particular basis, they could be just arbitrary states basically. So you can imagine that maybe there's like a, a correct state that the experiment was supposed to, to output, but maybe it's rotated by some small angle in some random direction. And you have several samples of these states that are all different sort of uh, with different perturbations. And you know, my conjecture is that you should just run the same algorithm, but I don't know how well it performs. It would be nice to analyze. Like if you have certain uh, variants of your distribution, how does that reflect in the, in the output fidelity? Yeah, so in, in a paper, we consider only qubits, but you can extend this to qubits. You can also have multiple outputs. You maybe you wanna have several copies of the psi, for example. Uh, you know, Again, so we consider only symmetric functions because then the semi different program reduces to linear program, but you know you could consider also non-symmetric functions and it's more complicated. Um, okay, so there's also this question. So like, you know, the way I explain the algorithm, we use the Schur transform, but it's not totally obvious to me that it's actually necessary to use a Schur transform. And it, it also contributed to the most of the complexity. It was, the complexity was n to the four, which comes from the Schur transform. Uh, but maybe it can be avoided. So if, like, you know, we basically, we use this weak shore sampling and then we do something to the, to the unitary register. Oh, my computer is gonna die. And, oh yeah, I didn't plug it in. Uh, but maybe, uh, yeah, maybe the shoot transform can be avoided in some way. Like there's something called generalized phase estimation. Maybe that can be used if people know what it is. Um, yeah, so as I said, I think there are some interesting connections with re regular quantum query complexity. So basically, you know, so so here the the measure that we have is not query complexity, but is 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 the output fidelity. But sort of there are some similarities, and and, and you know also, I think in some sense maybe what we are doing with the semi different program is like the it's maybe like the adversary method. So like I think there is also an interesting question of extending the adversary method to like uh, to quantum inputs and quantum outputs basically. Um, so anyways, that's another, and you know, as I mentioned, application to cryptography. So maybe, so this has kind of a, a cryptographic flavor. So maybe uh, it has some applications as well. Uh, yes, and so at the moment I'm working with my PhD student to extend this. So basically what I, what I very quickly explained was how to reduce the some different program to linear program, assuming extra sort of discrete symmetries like permutation symmetries. But uh, now we're working on a more general case. When you don't, don't have these extra symmetries, and then you have a semi-different program. So. All right, so that's all I wanted to say. Thanks a lot. So um, 